candidates, and here they are in alphabetical order. In Montreal, Quebec, Miriam Haddad, lawyer and the Green Party candidate in the last election in chateauguay la -Colle. In Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, Courtney Howard, an emergency room physician and president of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. In Montreal, Quebec, Dimitri Lascaris, lawyer and the Green Party's 2015 candidate in London West. Also in Montreal, Quebec, Dylan Maxwell, eco-entrepreneur and a six-time candidate for the Green Party of Canada in Quebec. And in Owen Sound, Ontario, Andrew West, lawyer and the party's justice critic who has run federally and provincially for the Greens. And we are delighted to welcome all of you, five candidates, for our second go-round on this. And let me just start by putting this premise out there, and we'll get into some discussion about it. When people think of the Liberal Party or the New Democratic Party or the Conservative Party, they, I suspect they have a sense about where on the political spectrum those parties live. I'm not sure that's the case with the Greens, and anyway, with a new leader coming in place, maybe you want to take the party somewhere else anyway. So let's have a bit of a conversation about that. Miriam, where do you see the Green Party of Canada being on that political spectrum? Well, uh, I, I, I think we are the most progressive party. And uh, we are a, grass, a true grassroots party. Um, all our policies are decided by the members. And um, we did some mistakes during the last uh, election. We just got to communicate our message and identity better. And um, if our slogan, our slogan needs to be aligned with our left wing platform. Courtney Howard, where do you see the party? You know, probably not surprisingly, I see everything through the lens of health. So I think the Green Party has the potential to be the most evidence-based voice in Canada, the most ethics-driven voice, and the most action-oriented voice. And I think we'll make the most progress if we set a well-being economy and the overall health and well-being of Canadians as our sort of central vision. So solutions come from the left, from the right, from the center, wherever. Is that it? I just want people to live long and be happy. Gotcha. Dimitri Lascaris, how about you on that question? I think we should, and by the way, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that I'm on the unceded land of Ganyangahaga people here in Montreal. Thank you for having us on, Steve. Um, I think we really have to answer that question by reference to the core values of the party. And the core values of the party, there are six of them. We, many Canadians know about ecological wisdom and sustainability, which has always been the focus of our party, but we also uh, embrace this core values social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, and respect for diversity. And these, to me, embody uh, a progressive platform, a progressive vision. Call it the left, call it socialism, call it, uh, you know, uh, more left of center, whatever it may be. That is the core of who we are. We are not fundamentally, when you look at our core values, a centrist party. We're certainly not a party of the right. And I think we should be proud of that fact. And I, I readily embrace it. Dylan Maxwell. Well, I think we have to use compassion and logic to make our decisions. We can't just jump to to one decision or another based on whether it fits into being a socialist or, or right wing. Um, for example, you know, drug policy. You look at Portugal; it works. You know, somebody on the right might go, "Oh no, it's uh, legalizing drugs. We don't want to do that." Well, does it work or does it not work? We have to focus on on what works, and we don't want to turn people off. I think in Quebec, being a socialist party would help us, but I think in the rest of the country, and I think people understand that, we shouldn't lock ourselves in. If we turn always turn left, we're going to go around in circles. If we always turn right, we're going to go around in circles. There's a lot of great ideas, like stopping there being billionaires and stuff like that, but how do you do that? You have to look at the actual facts and what's going to work and what's not going to work, and, and have compassion. Andrew West. Um, I think that I'm a moderate, and I'm... I am, pro I am an advocate for a thriving Canada. I think that the Green Party is in the center. I think that we are a party that has strong social economic policies, but I think we've also been a party that has shown that we are fiscally responsible and we can't lose that. I think if we shift the party towards the left, which a lot of people want to, a lot of candidates want to do, then we're going to have more candidates fighting over a smaller piece of the pie. If we want to get elected, and that should be the goal of the Green Party, is to get elected, then we need to stay in the center and attract votes who, disenfranchised voters who are fed up with the NDP and the Liberals, but also conservative voters who feel like the Conservative Party has lost their way, especially when it concerns the environment and fiscal responsibility. We should be that option to attract all of these voters. We're a big tent party, and we need to attract as many voters as we can to win. 
Okay, that establishes where the five of you are in terms of the vision on the political spectrum for the future of the party. Let's now talk about the thing that I'm sure is on everybody's mind who intends to participate in this leadership contest, and that is pollution. The skies, the environment. Look at the skies of our major cities. They are cleaner than they've been in years. That may be one of the very few things that this pandemic has delivered to us. However, uh, here comes the question. We want to take that positive development of cleaner skies and run with it. However, we are also being told that it's likely that people are not going to come back to public transit in the way they once did, and therefore people may drive more. We know when people go shopping nowadays, uh, they're using single-purpose plastic bags again. The reusable bags, we're told not to bring them. Uh, we may see in the future some things that seem very unenvironmental in order to deal with the times in which we live. So let's start with this. Courtney Howard, you start us off on this. How do we take advantage of the good things of this moment and really make transformational change? So I think what COVID has shown us is number one, we need to pay deep attention to the intersection between human health and the health of the rest of the natural world. This virus started in animals and made its leap into humans. And we've seen other similar viruses, much of it driven uh, by biodiversity loss. And we know that as the climate changes, we're gonna see animals changing in habitat and it actually increases the risk of further pandemics just like this. So I view the coronavirus crisis as a planetary health emergency, and in fact, the biggest reason we've ever had to take action on climate change and in reconcile our relationship with the natural world. So I think that what we've seen, the good part, is that when we work together and take action and our scientists are able to inform our policy in a really direct way, we can change the world really fast. And so when we see these pictures of, you know, the uh, streets in Toronto and the clean air, I think that that can be a vision that can help us envision a positive future that we can can move towards. Sometimes in the environmental movement, we've been not very good at painting where we want to go. We've been too busy scaring people about where we don't want to go. And so to me, this is a sign that we can sort of take hope from to say, hey, when we work all together, we can get the job done. And we know that, for instance, traffic-related air pollution in Toronto is responsible for about 20% of new pediatric asthma exacerbation. So if we can maintain this kind of good air quality, that keeps kids out of hospital, that saves healthcare costs, that reduces lung cancer, people live longer. So there's a lot of good reasons for us to do this that will help us keep us safe now, reduce healthcare costs, and keep our kids safe into the future. Overall, the thing we need to do is have a wholehearted vision of a healthy society. And the way we put that into law is with the Climate Accountability Act here in Canada. We've had such piecemeal policy with one party getting elected and then another party getting elected and completely changing things. We haven't made any progress. In the UK, where they brought the Climate Change Act in about 10 years ago, they've managed to reduce their emissions substantially. So we, we need to pass a law, legislate, um, greenhouse gas carbon budgets every five years. We need an independent scientific advisory body that continuously audits government policy and feeds back whether or not we're gonna make our target or not so that people can adjust on the go. So really, okay. I think this Dr. is about Howard, I'm gonna having jump in. a vision and moving towards our vision. Gotcha, okay. Dimitri Lascaris, why don't you pick that up and tell us how you'd handle this moment? Well, I think the lesson of this moment uh, amongst many others is that government must lead and government can lead. We have been told for decades that the means were not there to fund a rapid transition uh, to a renewable energy economy. And yet we've discovered, lo and behold, that when a pandemic erupts and our government was ill prepared for that, frankly, the government is able to summon tens of billions of dollars, even hundreds of billions of dollars to deal with the crisis of the moment. And I think that we as Greens can all agree that in the longer term, the climate emergency is an even greater threat to the existence of humanity and to the livability of our planet than this particular pandemic. So if we have the means to deal with massive government, by means of massive government intervention with this crisis, surely we have the means to do that with respect to a much more uh, pressing long-term uh, crisis, and that is the climate crisis. So I would say that we now know that this myth that the means are not there is in fact a myth. Uh, and I call upon the government, and as a leader of the Green Party of Canada, I will champion the notion that the government should come forward with a massive investment plan to transition to a renewable energy economy and to learn the lessons of the economic realities 
of, of, of the situation. And I just want to say one thing in response to a comment by uh, my brother Dylan in, in his opening remarks about what constitutes a moderate and not a moderate. In my opinion, we need to stop talking about persons who are ultimately defending the status quo as moderates. If you have a status quo that is leading you down the path of extinction, ultimately, that's extremism. The people who are the true moderates in this race are those who are calling upon this country and this party to take the steps necessary to deal with a fundamentally flawed economic system that is leading us down the path of climate crisis. Okay, Dylan, over to you. Well, first of all, I wouldn't call myself a moderate, though I do think we have to have public support. We have to have democracy. People can vote online for particular issues because we need public support for the radical things we need to do. Um, and uh, in terms of, of COVID, we need, the problem is still here. We need to take care of it. And, you know, you should ask not what the Green Party can do to, for you, but what you can do for the planet and for your fellow Canadians. So I'm giving away uh, free free mask. You can contact me and I'll give you a free mask if you donate to uh, the campaign at uh, greenparty.ca backslash capital X, capital D, capital D. One quarter of the money I, I uh, collect goes to um, giving out free masks to people. Uh, another quarter goes to actually burying carbon in the ground. You can check that out at uh, carbonface.ca. Um, we have to do things. We have to act. The government did not. They had a chance. You know, I think this shows what happens, what the difference a government makes in people's lives. Um, you know, if we, if we accept science, we all knew a pandemic was coming. Trudeau decided, like most countries, just to go on, do business as usual, think about what we're doing today, how we can make more money today. But Taiwan, they had less than seven deaths because they listened to the science, they knew what was coming, coming, and they prepared, just like we could have done, um, but we didn't do. And it's the same thing with climate change. We know what's coming. We need to prepare. We're going to do much better economically if we prepare and we start doing things now. But, but we shouldn't talk of things in this left and right thing. It's, you know, we should be focusing, focusing on a gro growth, global happiness, not about money. Sure, it's hard to be happy when you don't have a good place to live, when you don't have food. But by focusing on, on, on money, we're, we're looking at the wrong issues. You know, we, sure, we need shelter. Sure, we need some clothing. Uh, but we're all doing pretty. No, we're not all doing pretty well here. But I mean, we we have to think about what's important and not divide ourselves between what's left and right. We have to think about things. We have to do things like as an opposition. We have to propose policies that everyone can get behind, like having you know one income tax rather than six. In terms of you know when you hire people, I used to hire people, and they make it so complicated. And it's like I'll sweep up myself. I don't want to fill up all this paperwork. Okay. Hopefully we'll have a chance. Hopefully, we'll, we'll have a chance to discuss some of these ideas as we go along here. Andrew West, how would you respond to this particular moment in our history where we're making some environmental progress, ironically because of the pandemic, but it may also cause some non-environmental responses as well? Well, I don't necessarily think that we can't go back to the way things were before, where we started to transition away from single-use plastics, such as garbage bags, or sorry, sorry, as shopping bags and straws. And I think that, obviously, during the pandemic, some of those measures needed to be in place to go back to those shopping bags because people were concerned about bringing the virus in on canvas bags. But I think what this pandemic has shown is that when we put our minds to it, we can address the climate change, we can address the climate issues, and we can reach our Paris Accord target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30 percent below what they were in 2005 by 2030. So it's not a matter of fact that you know, people are going to get upset and they're scared to go back on public transit. We've developed a system in the past. People have learned that they need to use more reusable bags. They need to use more public transit. And now that I see that, given the right circumstances, humans can make a difference and a positive impact on our environment, I think that that's a sign that we should focus on and move forward and say, look, if we take what we've already learned, before and we take what we've learned now, then we can put those together and transition into a greener economy that will truly benefit society long term. And I just want to go back actually question something that, that um, Dimitri said. I think he was actually referring to me when he was talking about being a moderate because yes, I am. And unfortunately, we do need to look at our finances. The Green Party is in an amazing situation right now. After if you look at through it history, after traditional years of um, deficits, usually brought on by liberal parties, they've often turned to the Conservative Party thinking that they need to do this to control our debt to GDP ratio. So for example, in 2007, our debt to GDP ratio was 67%. Now it's around 90%. 
healthy economies like Germany stay around that 80% or that 60% range. If we utilize this opportunity properly, we can be shown as the party that Canadians can turn to in this hard economic times. Deficits are important in a time like this, but they weren't necessarily needed in the past four years. And if you look at the JIT to GDP ratio graphs, you can see a spike over the last years of the federal liberal government. People are going to be turning for a fiscally responsible option. The Conservative Party have proven ever since um, Stephen Harper that they are not there for the environment. They have failed the environment. We need to be ready and available for Canadians who care about fiscal responsibility and also care about the planet. Okay, and that's given, the most responsible option. Given that you mentioned Dimitri in your answer there, I should give him a chance to respond, and then I want to get Miriam on the original question that I asked. Go ahead, Dimitri. Thanks, Steve. I was itching to respond. Hmm. Uh, I'm so glad that that uh, uh, that Andrew, my colleague, raised the whole question about Germany and fiscal responsibility. In fact, Germany has shown an unhealthy and irrational obsession with uh, fiscal deficits. Japan, which is also a healthy economy and which is paying rock bottom interest rates, has a debt to GDP ratio in, order, in excess of 200%, far in excess of Canada's debt to GDP ratio. A country that has control of its own currency, that is as wealthy as Canada, that has a e highly educated population and bountiful natural resources and a, a a fundamentally stable political and legal system has the ability to invest to a far greater degree than we have. And it, you want to talk about fiscal responsibility. Is balancing a budget when you need to invest billions upon billions of dollars in a green transition fiscally responsible? I think that's fiscally uh, irresponsible, frankly. I think you make yeah. the investments that are needed to minimize the long term costs of this extraordinary damage to our civilization from the climate emergency. And if we have to borrow heavily to do that at rock bottom interest rates or interest free from the Bank of Canada, which we have the legal capacity to do, I support that 100%. I think we should start asking ourselves what actually is fiscal responsibility because there's a real problem out there in our understanding of what that is. Okay, let me get up to Miriam. I think you're framing, I think, sorry, if I may just real quick. Andrew, very I briefly. I think you're framing this. I think you're framing the question wrong, and I'll be very, very quick. The fact of the matter is, people, we, if we're not going to be fiscally responsible, then the fact is, is people just aren't going to vote for that sort of party. And we can be fiscally responsible, fiscally responsible and protect the environment. For example, cutting all sorts of subsidies for the oil and gas industry and the tar sands, not paying for the Trans Mountain Pipeline. There's so many other ways that we can be fiscally responsible and protect our environment. That's the vision that I see for the Green Party. Okay, gentlemen, I'm going up to Miriam now because Miriam still needs a chance to respond to the original question about taking advantage of this transformational moment in time in spite of everything. Go ahead, Miriam. Well, people will vote for for, uh, for people that have the political courage to stand up for Canadians. So while we saw a drop in air pollution during COVID-19, it wasn't enough. It shows that we need structural change. We need to make working from home more accessible with low cost speed internet for everyone. We need to make sure that our grid all goes all across the country is green. We need to move away from petrol. We are one of the highest users as well as exporters. We have also seen that rapid change is possible. The Canadian government was able to quickly distribute funds to make sure that people were able to live. We have now seen that if they wanted to act on climate change, they can start straight away. Okay, Miriam, let me stay with you for this. Let me stay with you for this next question because uh, I think public opinion polls showed after the last federal election that the public thought that the Liberals and New Democrats in particular had something good and useful to say about the environment, the Conservatives less so, but it does raise the question of whether or not they have become green enough to make the Green Party redundant in Canada. Maybe we don't need it anymore. What's your view on that? Well, uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe so at all. Um, first of all, the Liberals are just not able to keep their promises on the environment. Uh, the NDP, um, you know, just to let you know, the NDP uh, in BC, the provincial uh, NDP, is um, uh, just gave a permit to mine coal. Coal in 2020. A lot of progressives and socialists do not recognize themselves in the NDP anymore. And what we need to make sure is that social justice should be at the core of every single one of our policies. And the environment and the climate crisis, it goes hand in hand with, with um, uh, social justice. So, um, yes, we, we need the Greens and the Greens can win. 
Courtney Howard, do you think the other parties are green enough to render you redundant at this moment? Well, I asked a lot of people that question before deciding to run, and, and pretty much the smartest people I could find in Canada, and the overwhelming answer was, we're very much important. And we see that just because of how, you know, the Liberals, although they have done good things like bring a carbon price in and they've done good work on coal phase out, you know, they bought a pipeline. And so, and we're just not seeing the uh, targets that we need. We're not seeing the overall accountability uh, legislation that we need. And so, yes, I think it's super important that we have an evidence-based, really ethics-driven voice just laying down the bottom line and pulling us towards um, the action we need to take to keep today's kids safe. Sheldon, let's keep that five shot up there. We did this with the last group, and I want to do it with this group as well. Is there anyone among the five of you that would agree to build more pipelines in this country going forward? Anybody want a show of hands on that one? Okay, we got five no's. We had five no's the last time, so we're just confirming that all 10 candidates are against further pipeline building. All right, Dylan, why don't we get you to weigh in on this issue of whether or not we actually still need a Green Party in this country? Well, Trudeau wants to do the right thing, but he doesn't have the guts. Um, we need we need people who are willing to to look outside the box and and uh, do things differently. Like I think we should do in in terms of uh, the next election, we should set up a map where people can uh, actually look at the writing they're in. Because you know I think we lose seventy percent of our votes to people who who think they're voting strategically but are not voting strategically. Because in most of the writings, everyone knows who's going to win or not. Well, they don't know, but if you look at it, they don't know. And then we got to support the NDP and the Liberals. In, in the writings where it makes sense, in Pacific writings, doesn't mean we don't run a candidate. And that way, we can ensure the end, the conservatives never get back into power unless they do the, the right thing and support proportional representation. Uh, they, they got the most votes in the last election, and they didn't win. If that happens enough, they, they will change their mind and, like the NDP, uh, support. Um, a different electoral system. Well, since um, you brought up proportional he, representation, let me move to uh, Dimitri and ask him about that, because in the last federal election, the Greens did get 6.6% .6 of the votes, but that was good for three seats. Mm -hmm. The Bloc got literally 1% more vote than the Greens, and they didn't get three seats, they got 32 <laughs> seats. So we have a system that tends to punish parties that do not have an efficient vote. I'd like to know, and I know everybody says, let's bring in PR, proportional representation, but it's not going to happen. And I'd like to know, um, how, how do you make an appeal to the public to vote for you when so many of them think that voting for you is a wasted vote? Right, so, you know, there's no doubt in anybody's mind in the Green Party of Canada that the electoral system we have is fundamentally anti-democratic and that it has caused us uh, enormous prejudice our party would have had, you know, seat in parliament back in uh, the late 80s under a true proportional representation system. We would have been official party status by about 2004 under a true proportional representation system. Nobody has suffered more from this than we have. And we have every reason to continue to argue strongly and passionately for electoral reform. But you're quite right, Steve. This government, which promised, Justin Trudeau promised approximately 1,800 times to make first the, the 2015 election the last election under first past the post, we can't rely upon them to change the system for us. And we certainly can't rely upon the Conservatives to do that. We're going to have to find a way to get sufficient presence in Parliament and sufficient leverage to actually bring or force electoral form onto the legislative agenda. By our calculations, the calculations of my campaign team, we need about 35 seats to do that. I think the path to do that, I mean, remember that the NDP in the first past the post system actually formed the official opposition from, I think, about 2011 to 2015. We can do that, and we can do better under First Past the Post, despite the enormous challenges. But to do that, we have to unite progressives across this country, who I believe, and polling data clearly show, constitute a majority in this country. We have to speak to them by not only talking about the environmental crisis, the climate emergency, but also talking about workers' rights, talking about the crisis of inequality in this country, talking about racism in this country, and there is systemic racism in this country, and we need to put forward a, blow, a bold platform to deal with that. We can unite all the progressives in this country under the Green Party banner. That opportunity is there. And I, 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 for one, plan to make that a hallmark of my leadership if I'm given the privilege of leading this party. We are going to talk about racism for our next question, but I'd first like to get Andrew and, and the rest to weigh in on this issue of, of how you try to remain relevant and, and appeal to people for votes when they know that if they give you you know, even 10% of the vote, 
it doesn't translate into very many seats at all. Andrew, you want to come in on that? So the Green Party is extremely relevant and now so are more, more than ever. I think one of the things that we need to do first is change the narrative. And Steve, actually, maybe you as a member of the media can help with this. And that's actually to look at the actual term strategic voting. It's not strategic. An actual strategy would be to think about the party that you want to have elected and then do everything you can to help get that party elected, even if it means voting for them two or three or four in successive elections. Voting simply for one party to stop another party is out of is fear. It's fear voting. That's it. There's no strategy. There's no strategy in just picking the opposite party just to block a party. So we need to change that narrative. We need to make sure that our EDAs across Canada are stronger so we can help spread the word that we are a relevant party and we're ready to govern and to make sure that when the next election comes, we have a strong pan campaign set on the ground level to get going. Courtney Howard, what's the appeal? So I think the thing that we need to remember is all of the people who don't vote because they're completely disenchanted with just the tenor of political discussion, the sort of fighting. I think those are the people that we can excite. If we say, hey, you know, we're in a bad way. We know we're vulnerable. We know you're scared. But this is the path to safety. We need to solve COVID and climate at the same time. We need to change the way we target our overall vision to a well-being-based economy. We're going to support that by stabilizing our ecological foundation. We're going to keep people safe with a universal basic income. We're going to build the world together. The you want your kids to inherit, people will come out and vote. I think we have a moment, people are so vulnerable and we have the best opportunity to provide a really optimistic unifying vision. And that's how we're gonna get in. And after we get those seats, that's when we will pass a uh, proportional representation system. Miriam, I'd like to get you on that. You know, if you don't come first or second in our first past the post system, it really punishes you. And the Greens know that better than anybody. What would you do about it? You know, um, I really believe, I strongly believe in proportional representation, but the, we still need to inspire young people to vote for us. And that is going to be with political courage. Um, you know, also the, uh, the the example that you chose between the Bloc and the Greens, it's, it, it's a false example to use because we got 6% over 338 writings and the Bloc did on 78 writings only. And um, we give, uh, we need to give people the chance to vote for the best party rather than the least worst option. And we need to make, to be really, really clear on what we stand for. Okay, we've got less than 10 minutes to go here and we do need to talk about uh, what is clearly, um, you know, there are three issues in our society right now, basically, the pandemic, the economic devastation as a result of it, and anti-black racism, which uh, th this is a real moment in our history to deal with this issue. And Dimitri, you raised the issue of racism a second ago, so I wonder if you'd start us off mm -hmm. in a bit of a discussion about whether the words defund the police, what they mean to you and what you would do about it. Yeah, this unfortunately, Steve, has generated some uh, confusion. I I'm not a big fan of that phrase because it, it only talks about one half of the equation. One half of the equation is reducing funding per, for police, but it doesn't communicate what is going to happen with the money that is saved by reducing funding for police. A better phrase would be reallocation of police funding because that money should be taken to address the root causes of what our society has determined to be criminality. The root causes to a very large degree, an overwhelming degree, are social injustice, uh, poverty, homelessness, mental health crises, uh, substance abuse, and the police is like, uh, a, 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 it's a means whereby our society deals with the symptoms of the underlying causes of what we call criminality, but it doesn't deal with the, with the root causes. So I would say we need to reallocate resources from the police. I'm enthusiastically in favor of doing that towards social services, uh, supporting people who are suffering from substance abuse, from is it people who are in mental health crises, and, and, and really getting at the root problems of the behaviors that the police are uh, dealing with far too often in this country in a brutal and in a racist way. And, you know, I, I, I can't, uh, I, I, I must stress once again that there is an enormous overrepresentation of indigenous persons and black persons in our correctional system, incarcerated in the prisons around this country. The, you know, for example, indigenous persons, over 30% of inmates in correctional institutions are indigenous and they constitute less than 5% of the population. As a lawyer who has litigated 
on behalf of the disadvantaged for virtually my entire career, I can tell you that there's only one rational explanation for this incredible disparity between incarceration rates and population rates, and that is systemic racism. Okay, That's let me what make we sure have in this country. Let's get everybody else in here on this one as well. Miriam, um, defund you. the police. What does it mean to you, and would you do it? Well, you know, defund the police, I think it really resonates, and it's, it is what people are asking uh, in the streets. Um, so the Black Lives Matter movement, but there's also the Indigenous Lives uh, uh, Matter movement that we need to talk about. Uh, so we need to recognize the violence towards our Indigenous, uh, to, uh, towards indigenous communities. Uh, the RCMP was created uh, specifically to move uh, Indigenous people into re onto reserves. So if you have a, um, an institution that was created specifically for that, uh, it cannot be reformed in any way. So it needs to be uh, defunded and reinvested in, into the communities. And it could be invested in affordable housing. It could be access to free pharmacare, safe injection sites. Uh, there are many ways uh, to, to reinvest in the communities, to get out people from out of poverty. Uh, this is how you uh, live in a more just society when we need to think about everybody like that it's it's uh, it's something that um uh, you know like it's 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 really and it's defunding the police it's not only just defunding it but it's also a road to abolition because this would be the uh, the end of it can i understand what you're saying you believe in abolishing the police altogether of course but it's on the long run of course over what period of time I wouldn't be able to tell you. I'm not saying that there wouldn't be any security or the police wouldn't be, um, um, there wouldn't be any existence uh, of, uh, of a uh, uh, safety to people. But defunding the police, what it means, it's a road to abolition. All right, understood. Dylan Maxwell, where are you on this issue of defund the police? Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a good idea. And I think you uh, to at least start down that road as much as possible. I think you for any problem, you, need, you should look around the world and see what works. So like in, Port in uh, Portland, Oregon, I think 17% of the money from the police or something like this went to um, people with actual uh, deep training in psychological issues. And uh, it's working out quite well. In New Jersey, they got rid of the whole police force. It is sort of more community-based force. And the crime went down by something like 50%. You have to look at, at what has worked in other places and come up with new ideas. So one of my ideas is for the police to, to give $20 to every person of color they stop. Um, this would uh, compensate a little bit to the uh, trauma and inconvenience of being stopped, and it would make the police think twice before, before they uh, stop them. Uh, we, we do have a, a huge problem, and, you know, the police need to be uh, trained better. And, you know, it's not as bad as in the States, but, you know, the police, they, they collect money, um, and the money often goes back to them. Um, and it's a really, you know, the type of people get into policing in the first place. There's a lot of good police people, but there's also people uh, who, who feel, well, this is a place uh, they can beat people up. I remember in high school, this person wanted a bribe from me to join the DJ club. And lo and behold, he became a police officer. What a surprise. Hmm. You know, we have to weed these people out. Courtney and, Howard? And we have to do everything we can. Courtney Howard, your view on defund the police. So I agree with Dimitri that I think that this is most helpfully framed as redistributing resources. Um, you know, I'm a frontline worker and I have been for a long time in small emergency departments in the North. The RCMP keep us safe. There have been many moments in my life where people have been in danger and I've been very happy to see them arrive. But just as we found in healthcare after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations came out and we looked at the studies that said, you know, showed, hey, if you show up in an emergency department in uh, Canada with chest pain, you're a lot more likely to get an angiogram if you're not Indigenous than if you are. We need to develop increased insight into the systemic racism and the unconscious bias that we have. And I was disturbed by some of the comments from the RCMP leadership in the last little while that seemed to not indicate um, an appreciation of that. I have most definitely witnessed systemic racism racism within Canadian healthcare uh, structures as well as within RCMP behavior. And so I think that restorative justice is a way of changing the power differential and bringing in some Indigenous land healing practices that could be much more uh, helpful for people in the long run. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of de-escalation training and community-based work. Andrew West. 
Well, this is an area that I'm definitely more in line with Dimitri. Um, I think it's a positive step that organizations like the RCMP acknowledge that systemic racism exists, which it does, and they actually have just recently acknowledged that. I think that once that's acknowledged, then you can start to find solutions that will better help society, all members of our society. I do think that police officers put themselves into dangerous situations and they do need resources to make sure that they are protected. But I think it's clear that different resources are needed for different situations. And for me, a great example is what, and an unfortunate example is what happened recently with Regis Korczynski Parquet. Um, it was a situation where her mother called asking for help because her daughter just had some epileptic episodes and had some mental issues. Now, I'm in favor of reallocating resources to the department to better have um, equipment and resources for situations to deal with matters like that. And I think that those situations, dealing, doing that will help benefit society as a whole. And I think the Green Party also has great issues in addressing poverty, which is another element that needs to be addressed, as others have mentioned. And we have, we're, the big, we're probably the biggest proponent of any party for a guaranteed livable income. And I think that a guaranteed livable income is a win-win. I've obviously talked about fiscal responsibility. And if you look at the city of Ottawa, when it comes to, for example, making sure that people have proper housing, well, it's often cheaper to pay for a bed in social housing than it is to pay for a bed in a hospital or in a jail, which for a lot of people sometimes can be the only alternative. Yeah. So these are the win-win situations that I look for and that I see the Green Party addressing. Okay, we are Sorry. literally down, forgive me everybody, we're down to our last minute, and I have to give it to Miriam because they tell me in the control room that she has had the least speaking time so far, and I wanna be fair. So Miriam, finish off on this. So what's the moment? Go ahead. You you take the sorry, last word. I, I gotta address whatever was said because, like Mr. Percival Maxwell, I gotta admit your twenty dollar solution is is super racist. And as a person of of color, I find it very very offensive. Also, like what if you you want to pay people to address systemic racism? It, it does nothing. Uh, what would be the next step if if the person gets beaten up, we give them fifty? No, like I, I want. That's not I, what I want. I, I, I want to stop Sorry. people from telling that. Minute, please. It's my minute, right? It's my minute. Go ahead. Also, concerning, concerning the UBI, um, uh, we need to, yeah, the UBI is great, but we need to maintain our uh, uh, social safety net. Uh, so that's uh, important to mention also. Okay. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Uh, thanks to the five of you, Miriam Haddad, Courtney Howard, Dimitri Lascaris, Dylan Maxwell, Andrew West. We're so glad you could join us for our Green Party debate here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. Well, last night we featured the debate among the other five candidates. If you missed it, it's archived on our website. That's tvo.org slash the agenda. Or you can find it on our YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash the agenda. For all of us, this pandemic has meant a steep learning curve. For medical experts and researchers, well, if ever their work was more in the spotlight, it's hard to think of when that would have been. As almost all of Ontario is now reopening and we're trying to learn to live with COVID-19 in our midst, we welcome Dr. Isaac Bogosh for the latest. He is an infectious diseases physician at the University Health Network and a scientist based out of the University of Toronto. And Dr. Bogosh, it's good to see you again. How are you managing so far? Uh, not too bad. Thanks for having me back on. Not at all. It's good to see you. Let's start with the obvious. Almost all of Ontario is now moving into stage two, with the exception of Windsor-Essex in southwestern Ontario. What is your advice to the people who will no doubt now start flocking to uh, patios, to hair salons, to mani-pedi places, etc.? Certainly, it's wonderful to have these newfound freedoms. It's wonderful that we've reached the stage where we can lift these public health restrictions. We still have to remember that there's still a pandemic. And even though we're doing well in Canada, if we look outside of our borders, uh, the world is really getting worse and not better. We know how contagious this infection is. It is not gone here in Canada. It is not gone here in Ontario. And we still have to be vigilant to adhere to these tried and tested public health measures that work. Physical distancing hand hygiene, putting on a mask where you're in an indoor environment. It's as simple as that. If we can adhere to those measures, we can do well with this gradual reopening and the staged reopening. We'll prevent ourselves and others from getting this infection if we do that. Masks indoors, yes. What about masks outdoors on patios where I know 
the establishments are going to try to establish physical distancing protocols, but it's going to be tricky. It sure is. Uh, you know, there's the public health angle and then there's the science angle. From the science angle, I think this is a fascinating area uh, to discuss because it's not entirely clear what the degree of transmission is in outdoor environments. And certainly in Ontario, we've had a few high profile events. First, we've had the Trinity Bellwood uh, event uh, several weeks ago now, and it doesn't really look like that contributed to uh, any bump in cases. Certainly, we've seen Black Lives Matter uh, and many protests throughout Canada and the United States. We saw varying degrees of mask use. Uh, varying degrees of physical distancing in, in these protests that involve thousands and thousands of people. And to date, key word to date, we haven't seen a big spike in, in cases there. Um, uh, certainly there was a, a scene from Cherry Beach in Toronto from this past weekend with big crowds in those settings. Way too soon to know if there's any transmission from those settings. So the, the key point here is it's not entirely clear what the role is of masks in outdoor settings. Uh, that's from a scientific standpoint. If we're talking from a public health standpoint, the message is if you can't maintain physical distancing, put on a mask. That's pretty simple. But uh, I wonder if that's going to change when we actually look at data from outdoor environments. And I'm very curious to see some of the science and the epidemiology evolve on that front. Okay. Well, one thing we certainly do know is that some other jurisdictions, be they provinces, states, countries, some which have recently reopened in a bigger way have seen their cases spike up a lot and now some of them i gather are having to retrench and tell people whoops uh, you better get back to where we once were which politically is a very tough thing to do talk to us about the province of ontario if heaven forbid as we reopen cases start to spike again what numbers right we've been less than 200 a day or around 200 a day for I don't know, eight of the last 10 days, something like that. What numbers would necessitate our closing up a little bit more again? Uh, well, I think here's what's going to happen. It's not unexpected. In fact, let me say that a different way. It's expected to see spikes in cases or outbreaks in cases. Like this is how this infection manifests itself. It's patchy uh, about, you know, we've heard this term, this 2080 rule, where about 20% of people are responsible for about 80% of infections. There's going to be pockets uh, and, and small outbreaks of this infection. We've seen this globally, and we will see this in Ontario, and we'll see, we've already seen it throughout Canada, where you know there's going to be a case here, a case there, a small outbreak here, and essentially we're going to be playing whack-a-mole trying to quell these little outbreaks as they pop up. That is totally expected. Now, if we don't have systems like early detection systems, or we don't have the capacity to rapidly respond to those and quell those outbreaks, and they sort of snowball into a much larger outbreak, Obviously, that's a huge problem. And in a situation like that, I think it's very likely that we'll see uh, re-imposition of these public health restrictions. We've seen this in places that have done this right. So in Germany, in South Korea, in Japan, in many of these places, they have, who have managed this infection very well. They've had outbreaks, expectedly. They have successfully quelled those outbreaks. But I think it's important for people to recognize that lifting these public health restrictions is not a one-way path forward. Right. There's going to be ebbs and flows and certain areas might need to clamp back down and, and lift back up as we contend with this virus in the pre-vaccine era. It's, uh, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be challenging. And I think that's an extremely important part of the communication that sometimes gets lost as everyone gets excited to go, you know, have a drink on a patio or get their hair cut. It's that you know, this is this isn't over yet. We still have a pandemic and this is still affecting us in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada. Sure, but everybody's looking to metrics to see, now that we're in stage two, okay, when do we get to think about stage three? And if we're around <laughs> 200 cases a day, 200 new cases a day, people have gotten pretty encouraged about that. That's pretty good. If as we reopen, we get up to say 400 cases or 500 cases a day with the reopening, would the advice from you therefore be, sorry, not going to stage three until we get them lower? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If there's high degrees of sustained community transmission, first of all, there's no way that I think the, the province will move to stage three. And secondly, they'll probably go from stage two back to stage one. Just like we reopened in a regional manner, I would bet that they would close or shut back down in a regional manner as well. And of course, if there was a, a large provincial issue or if there was widespread disease transmission, then they may opt to take a province wide approach. But uh, I don't think there's going to be a firm 
number. I don't think you're going to see one metric uh, that's going to be driving this. This will likely be a, a combination of metrics to, to paint a more holistic picture of what is actually happening. What is the reason behind those numbers and, and what's driving the, the outbreak? So, you know, certainly, for example, you can have a very focal outbreak for example, in a meatpacking plant or a congregate setting where there's a lot of new cases and there's remarkably little spillover outside of that. If, 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 if it's jumped on right away and if there's careful contact tracing and, and, and isolation of close contacts and, and those affected. Um, and, and you might not need to reimpose public health measures across a giant area because of a focal outbreak. But that really only works if you jump on those outbreaks quickly. So I think it's very hard to pick a single number or a single metric to drive a public health policy. And they'll be looking for a more holistic approach into what's happening in order to, to either lift or reimpose public health restrictions. Let me ask you about the border, because we know that American and Canadian officials have agreed to keep the border closed through much of July. At what point should we start to reconsider that and look at potentially reopening that border? So it's hard to know, but clearly it's not now. And we look south of the border and we see things getting pretty bad in many of the states. So there's, I, I, I keep track of this every day, but there's several states that are getting worse and worse and worse. And, and you know, places like Florida, Texas, uh, Arizona, Southern California are showing, you know, very high numbers of new cases per day. And we're starting to see healthcare systems stretch beyond capacity. And sadly, it, 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 the arrows may be pointing toward what was what was seen in New York several months ago, where the healthcare system was stretched beyond capacity. Uh, it's going to be hard to right that ship. And, and even if they even if they took every step necessary, even if they took the more ex most extreme step, like imposed a lockdown there, it would still take a while to right that ship. And we know that many of those places are not taking uh, extreme measures to get this under control. And we're watching these curves shoot up with some, some of these places have exponential growth of, of COVID-19. It's really upsetting to watch. So uh, short story long, I don't think they're going to be opening the border anytime soon. And I think that's the right move. Uh, it's hard to know what the exact number is for when they'd want to reopen the border. But even if the border starts to get reopened, we'll still need measures to track people that come into Canada to ensure that they're not importing this infection. We've done so much hard work here, and uh, it would be terrible to undo it if we import lots of these infections. Hmm. Let's come back to the issue of masks for a second. And you, you've told us when it makes sense to wear masks, and you've told us that the jury is out when it comes to outdoors. But I wonder whether you believe, I mean, it can't be a bad thing to put a mask on when you think you're going to be near other people, right? We know that much. So do you think the province of Ontario ought to be buying literally millions of masks and distributing them to the population for free? I do. I think that's a great idea. I think uh, there's other places that have done this and have done this successfully uh, on a macro level. So you're seeing this, for example, done in, in places like Alberta. And then uh, on a more micro level, you, you're seeing this done successfully. So there's several uh, large grocery chains that, for example, when you walk in the front door, they have someone standing there with a box of mask, masks. They have these tongs. They sort of put the tongs in, hand you a mask, and you either put it on or you don't put it on. Now, of course, my bias is put it on. You're going inside. You're going to be around other people. Put a, put a damn mask on. It's not that hard. But um, but if you watch these settings when people are just normalizing it and making it convenient and passing them out, it, it's remarkable how many people actually put, put a mask on. I think it's a, it's a terrific initiative. So if we make these available, if we hand them out, if we normalize this behavior, especially in settings where you really should be wearing one, I'm, I'm all for it. I think that would be great. And I think when we think about, you know, interventions and the cost of different interventions and the bang you get for the buck, this is probably one of the more cost effective and reasonable interventions. And again, you got to think about where you're going to be doing something like this, right? It, it, Ontario is a huge place. Um, and of course, we should encourage this everywhere. But if you're really going to be a stickler, you'd start this in the higher impacted regions like Peel, Toronto, Windsor, Essex. Like that's where I'd focus the attention now and then you could sort of spread to other places after that. There is a debate as to whether or not the government of Ontario ought to pass a law forcing people to wear masks when they're indoors. What's your take on that? I mean, 
very weary about that as of today. Of course, things can change, but as of today, I'd be kind of weary of, of something like that. If you're going to mandate it, then you've got to think about several other condi- uh, other things. One, enforcement. How are you going to enforce that? Are you going to fine people for not wearing a mask? Uh, we know how well that played out from a public perception and trust in public health standpoint in Toronto when ticketing officers were giving people $800 tickets for walking through a park. That that actually was extremely detrimental to um, people having trust in the system and, and buying in. So, you know, you could think about enforcing it, but you've got to really think about how you're going to enforce it. Uh, if you're not enforcing it, if it's a finger wag or providing education for mask wearing, then that's not a mandate. That's a strong recommendation, which we already have. The next thing you've got to think about is equity. If you're going to mandate them, You've got to give them out for free. You cannot restrict people from interacting with the world around them simply because they don't have the financial means or the capacity to buy or produce a mask for themselves. You just can't. That, that, that's a, there's a huge equity issue here. So uh, if you're going to mandate it, you give them out for free. The third thing is geography. And when I think about geography, I think about micro geography. So where are you going to mandate these? You have to be smart. If you're going to mandate them, then mandate them in the appropriate settings. For example, indoor settings. Are you going to start to mandate these in outdoor settings? Eh, it gets a little questionable in that, in that, in that regard. And then when we think about geography, I think about geography on a macro level setting. So Ontario is a huge place. Uh, you know, we look at some places in Ontario where there's disease transmission. Then, uh, for example, Peel, Toronto, Windsor, Essex, and then you look at other places where there's little to no disease transmission, you know, Kenora, Timmins, Thunder Bay. It's a lot easier to tell people to put on a mask when you're in a high burden area. But imagine the challenges you're going to have forcing people to wear a mask to get on a bus in Kenora, Ontario, or in North Bay. I think people have to think uh, outside of downtown Toronto. And there's a lot of sort of downtown Toronto centrism when we, when we hear about policies like this. And these are just things to consider. Um, uh, so uh, there are alternative approaches. Now, look, if there's a huge outbreak and it's widespread throughout Ontario, uh, you know, we may get to that point where mandating it is is going to be the right move. But like as of today, I just don't think it's the right move. I appreciate that there's tremendous uh, strong opinions on this, to say the least. Uh, I also appreciate that we're not the United States. And I, as politicized as this issue is, has become, we are not the United States, where I think that mass debate is, is rather disgusting, where it's basically devolved into, you know, if you're a Democrat, you wear a mask, and if you're a Republican, you don't. I mean, this is insane. This is insane. Uh, let's keep it Canadian. Let's keep it reasonable and logical. Let's have meaningful debate on this issue. But personally, at this point in time, I don't think mandating them is the right thing. Okay, we're a little over a minute to go here. And um, I have a bit of an odd question to ask you for our final question here, which is, what do you still not know about this that you wish you did? Oh, got an hour. So <laughs> in one minute, I would say the immunology of this infection and how it pertains to creating a successful vaccine. Because at the end of the day, that's our way out of the mess that we're in. And if we have a good understanding of the immunology of this infection and we can harness that to create a durable and successful vaccine that can be deployed globally, we're good to go. Um, and that relies on a really good understanding of how the pathogen interacts with the host and harnessing that information for vaccine creation. So I think that is the million dollar question. I think we'll have some very good answers to that in the hopefully months ahead. And, uh, and I'm, I'm following that literature very closely. Well, I was going to ask, I, I wouldn't expect you to know about the dozens, if not hundreds of attempts around the world that are currently ongoing to find a vaccine. But based on what you do know, any sense of where we're at? I'm cautiously optimistic. I think there's some very promising trials and watch for this Oxford trial. We're going to have results of that available probably in July or early August. This is a, a huge clinical study and it's actually answering the question, does it work or not? I mean, in a population setting, will this provide protection? If it does, hallelujah. I mean, I hope they mass produce this and distribute it as, as far as possible. Uh, in addition to that, there's other vaccines. We're going to need several vaccines and over there's about 100 30, 140 in development, well, most of them are going to fail. But if we have two, three, four successful candidates that can be mass produced and, and administered worldwide, we'll have done something well and we'll be able to at least start to return to normal soon. And do we assume hydro, whatever the heck that's called, hydroxychloroquine is not part of the solution? 
I would say that's dead in the water. Uh, there may be a few unanswered questions with regards to that, but we certainly have some other treatments that are shown to really help. And for example, there's a really impressive study on a drug called dexamethasone. It's a, it's a steroid, widely available, cheap. Uh, anyone who practices hospital medicine is very comfortable using that drug. And uh, there's a really great study out of the UK showing that in hospitalized patients who are needing oxygen therapy for their COVID-19 infection, it reduces the probability of death. Pretty important metric, great drug that seems to be effective, and you can be sure that that's uh, likely changing practice all over the world. So I also like that this is not, you know, some fancy schmancy, hard to get drug like remdesivir that we heard about before that you've got to rely on a company to mass produce this. I mean, dexamethasone is ubiquitous and uh, we all know how to use it. So it's great that we have a, a simple tool that will be helpful. Dr. Bogosh, uh, we, I guess, apologize for taking you away from your official duties for as long as we have, <laughs> but we're really grateful that you could spend this time with us and help inform all of us who are watching and listening to you right now. Thanks so much and take care. Have a great day. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, June 24th, 2020. At the very time that many are pressing hard for police reform or more because of anti-black racism, the first black police chief in the provincial capital, Mark Saunders, is stepping down. Tomorrow, we'll talk to him about his legacy and his decision to leave that post early. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. TVO. 50 and still learning. How can science solve an artistic mystery? A human hair. Now, if we can get DNA from it, we can prove that it's Lucian Freud's. I'd just like to know who painted it. Follow art detectives Philip Mould and Fiona Bruce as they solve a series of thrilling artistic mysteries. Imagine fakes at the heart of the French art establishment. Is your painting this missing link? And I've reached my decision. Shall I open it? Faker Fortune, season five, continues next on TVO. Take two politicians. Your government almost bankrupted this province. With opposing points of view. The taxpayer is gonna be burdened with all these costs. And send them on a blind date to debate an issue. I need a subway. Why does it have to be underground? Can political rivals find common ground? Support farmers to be able to do more of this. You call it incentives, I call subsidies. They want us to do a better job. Catch the third season of Political Blind Date 